Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Well, good morning. Um, hey, before we get rolling here, I just want to make a, an announcement, something Gail and I have been looking forward to for a while. And uh, by uh, the grace of God, we're, um, we're looking forward to being able to take our first sabbatical in um, 31 years of service here at Atascadero Bible Church starting in July. So uh, we're going to be taking a sabbatical um, for uh, six months from July 1st through the end of the year. And uh, really excited about that. People ask, well, what are you going to do? Well, part of it is that we'd like to travel uh, a little bit. Uh, we have a, a fifth wheel, and we're going to try to do some of the western United States and all that. It's embarrassing, you know, when you show up someplace and this European that's been in the country for three weeks has seen more of the USA than you have. You ever had that experience? And uh, so anyway, so we'd like to see a few things, and that kind of thing is a part of it, and then, then some other things as well that will be a part of that time of sabbatical. And, and so um, we're looking forward to that. It's something that's been delayed two times now. Uh, we've been working on it for a while. And uh, third time's a charm, uh, we're hoping, and so we're looking forward to that. Um, in terms of the teaching team and all of that, we're, we're in good shape with Jeff Atherstone, Jeff Erke uh, stepping in, uh, and then Adam Weatherby is going to be preaching once a month uh, during those six months as well, so he's graciously agreed to step in there as well, so uh, we'll, we'll not miss any of that in terms of the teaching team. Jeff Erke is going to be taking the, the lead role here uh, in my absence and uh, very confident in everything that God's done in him and, and, and prepared him even for this. So anyway, I just wanted to make you aware of that as, as something that's coming up. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 as we continue. Uh, last week we talked about being prepared for service and uh, you know being ready. And so uh, now we're going to talk about ready for what? Well, ready for... For service, all right, and this is what it's going to look like. Um, just a little background again to remind you uh, Peter was on a very short timetable and he knew it. Uh, Jesus in the Gospel of John told Peter, Hey, Peter, listen, when you were younger, you used to go anywhere you wanted and you used to kind of take care of yourself, but when you get older, you're going to go where you don't want to go. Uh, John, who wrote the Gospel, kind of wrote a little commentary on it saying uh, he was signifying the kind of death that Peter was going to die. Peter turns and looks at Jesus' best friend who happened to be John and looked over at John and then looked back, to, looked back at Jesus to say, well, what, what about John? What's going to happen to him? And basically Jesus responded by, what's it to you? In essence, mind your own business. It doesn't matter. You follow me. And so Peter was on a journey following Jesus, knowing that he was going to die a very painful death like Jesus, that his time was very short. In fact, it would be about a year before Peter would go meet Jesus face to face once again as a result of his own execution. This book began by talking about being born again, which is that beginning relationship that we have with God. Last week we talked about being ready to respond because so many times we miss opportunities that God brings our way just because we're not ready. And so we have to be mentally prepared, you know, and spiritually prepared when he said, gird up your mind for action, be ready to respond. And we talked about the color codes of awareness, you know, being ready to respond when, when God comes. And so then it becomes ready to do what? Well, ready to do this, okay? Number one, love others. Look what he says in verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth been purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, okay? You, you're, you've been prepared in essence purified for sincere love of the brethren fervently love one another from the heart now when Jesus was here he told his disciples listen um, let me just summarize all of the Old Testament all of the law and everything for you in two ways that you'll simply be able to remember hopefully guys you can remember two things okay here it is love God 
with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, everything you are, okay, and love your neighbor as yourself, all right? Those, those are the two things. You do those two things, you got it all. So Peter comes back to restate what he had heard from Jesus, and so it's the call for us who've been born again is to love God and to, to love others. And it's interesting because in this call, you know, um, there's a lot of people that say, yeah, you know, I get, I get that we're supposed to love God and we're supposed to love people, but I'm not really a people person. I'm kind of shy. To which I would like to say, I totally understand that, okay? I get that, all right? But here's the thing. You were born into this world, okay, with a problem. Uh, it happens to be your sin nature. You were born with a sin nature, okay? And the fact is, is that you were estranged from God, and as a result of that, you're alienated from people as well, whether you know it or not. Most people don't, by the way. So when you come into a experience of being born again, you then become reconciled to God, but God says, that's not enough. I want you, in fact, now to be reconciled to people as well. So to those who would say, I am shy by nature and all that, I would say, yes, you are shy by your old nature, but guess what? You are now born again. It may be harder for you than other people, but it doesn't mean it's impossible for you. You must engage. And so God is calling us all of us, every one of us, every one of us who's born again, regardless of whether you're shy or not, you're a people person or not, to engage with people, fervently love one another from the heart. Why? Because, verse 23, you've not been born again of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, okay? As though through living, the living and enduring word of God. You're, you're, you have been born again through the living word of God. And, and here's what Peter understands about his own life, and he wants us to grasp too. Life is short. Life is short. The opportunities that will come your way are limited. And the fact is, he goes on and he says in verse 24, for all flesh is like grass, all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers, flowers fall off. Isn't it amazing? You know that uh, environmentally, the central coast is almost identical to Israel. So when we talk about seasons and all of those things, it just, it's just a parallel to Israel. Like, for example, three weeks ago, I had Lupin out in the front field right in front of my house. And, uh, and, um, and now they're gone. Just that, that, that quickly. Just, just a few weeks ago, they were beautiful. They were there. They don't smell the greatest. I don't love the smell of Lupin, but, but they look nice. But now they're, they're just gone. And it's just amazing how quickly the seasons change and how green the grass can be. And suddenly, it just like in one night, it just seems like, oh, it's brown now. It, it, it's, that's the way life is, okay? And so when he talks about this, this love that we're to have, we only have a limited amount of time and opportunity to engage with people. So let's talk about what love is, positively what love is. He says, fervently love one another from the heart. What does that mean? It means that it is active, it is intentional, it includes emotion, it is emotional, and it is genuine. These four things at a minimum, are what fervent love includes. Now, in your small groups, in your community groups, you'll have opportunity to develop this. Our notes are a little more extensive than we usually give you so that you have an opportunity, because we're covering a lot of stuff today, to pursue this a little bit more on your own. The idea that it is something that we choose to do, it is active, it is intentional, it's deliberate on our part, it includes opening ourselves up to other people on a deeper level of emotion and it's got to be real it's genuine all of these things are included in fervent love now on the negative side what love is not first peter chapter 2 verse 1 therefore putting aside all malice deceit hypocrisy envy and slander these are a list of things that love is not malice malice is a desire to cause someone pain or injury all right? Usually as a result of us being hurt, we want to hurt somebody else. We want them to hurt like us. That's malice. Deceit. It's deceiving someone either by concealing or misrepresenting the truth. Deceit is interesting to me because oftentimes we use deceit in a way that we include a little bit of truth, but we paint a narrative that in fact ultimately is not true, 
although it includes some truth, all right? Hypocrisy is telling other people to not do what we do, okay? So we tell them, don't do it, but we actually do it ourselves, many times secretly, trying to appear to be better than we really are. Envy is wanting what someone else has and resenting them for having it. <laughs> a guy this week that we were listening to, Jimmy Dodds, we had a, a, a pastor's conference on the Central Coast that we as the pastor's network of the Central Coast hosted in Avila. Had about 100 pastors there and, uh, on Thursday. And, and Jimmy said this about envy and, and, and jealousy. He says, jealousy is nothing more than you have more of my idol than I do and I'm mad about it. <laughs> I thought, what a great definition. You have more of my idol than I do, and I'm mad, you know, that you do. And that's what envy really is as well. And then slander is making a false statement, damaging someone's reputation. Again, often weave with a little bit of truth. Now, can we agree that this list, all these things are bad? Can we just agree on that, right? They're bad, right? And can we agree that we shouldn't do it? Can we agree on that also? Okay, so there we've got it, right? It's bad and we shouldn't do it, okay? And if you're doing it, can I just tell you one thing? All right, stop it! All right, good enough. We're good to go, right? Here's the thing is that it's not good enough. <laughs> you know what's amazing to me is, is that uh, when, whenever, we, um, whenever we ask the question, do we do this, eh, maybe we do it once in a while or whatever, it's, we have this amazing amnesia. We just don't remember any of this. But here's the thing. If I were to ask you, have you ever had any of these things or all of these things done to you? Every one of us here would go, oh, yeah. In fact, if we were to break up right now into small groups, okay, we're not going to do that. Okay, but if we were to break up into small groups right now, get you in groups of four to six people and say, hey, you know, share your story. Pick one of those things and share a time that somebody did that to you. Every one of us could do it. I mean, some of you could put a time date stamp on it. I mean, you remember it, all right? You know, I can remember exactly where I was and what, you know, and all those kinds of things. See, here's the deal. We remember when it's done to us. We just don't remember it when we do it to others. And here's what Peter's telling us. Hey, you hate it when people do it to you. <laughs> don't do it to other people. That is not love, okay? Second thing, Roman numeral two, is this love God's word first Peter 1 25 and this is the word which was preached to you first Peter 2 2 like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord if you have tasted salvation God's kindness and mercy to you and you want to grow, there is only one way to do that. It's feeding on the word of God. God's word is the thing that will help you to grow. And so many times people want to grow, but they don't fall in love with the word of God. Friends, it's incumbent upon us, if we're gonna grow like a baby grows, we've gotta have milk, we've gotta have the nutrients. And where does that come from? It comes from the word of God. And you know, we all suffer from from bad choices that we make or, or things that happen to us that hurt us. And when we come to the word of God, we begin to look into the word of God and see what he says about us, see what he says about our situation. The Bible is called a mirror, okay? Now, I would venture to guess that every single woman here today, before you came to church, at least glanced in the mirror. Now, I know some of you guys didn't, okay? I'm just saying, all right? But, but I, know, I know all of the women did, you know? And, and it's just something that you do, you know? And the truth of the matter is, God wants us to look into his mirror as well so that we see how we really look and, and to take action, okay? So, again, we're moving through a significant passage of Scripture here and moving pretty quickly. We could do a whole sermon just on that. We're not, all right? I'm making some assumptions here that you're convinced <laughs> now we move on to something that's that's interesting and, and that is is that there's this idea of being rock solid that God calls us to be rock solid you know um, Peter loves rocks you know why Peter loves rocks okay because that was his name all right he was the original Rocky all right he was Rocky one before there was a Rocky one Sylvester Stallone was Rocky two really okay 
he was rocky Jesus said you know Peter I'm telling you this Peter you're a rock you know and and ultimately when Peter made this confession about Christ he says I'm going to build my church on that confession on that and that's a rock and all of this so now Peter starts talking about stones and rocks and all of this and that's extended in this passage let me read it for you okay if you have your Bibles you can look down it's not on our overheads it says this, and coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men but a choice and precious in the sight of God, okay, obviously talking about Jesus, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for the holy priesthood to the offering of spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Now he goes to the Old Testament. Behold, I lay a foundation, or I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. This is of precious value, verse 7 says. The stone which the builders rejected became the very cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense. For they stumbled because they were disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed Jesus is the living stone why is Jesus the living stone you know why Jesus is the living stone because he was resurrected from the dead so he begins to do this and he says you know what not only is the living stone but he is also the precious stone he is the chosen stone he quotes from Isaiah and the Psalms and he brings to life this concept that the Jews the Israelites Loved this concept of, of rocks. I mean, it is unbelievable how much of the Bible talks about rocks. To us, rocks are a nuisance. They're not a big deal. To the Israelites, you know, it's like they always talk about rocks. Why? How many of you have been to Israel? Raise your hand if you've been to Israel. Okay, you already know why they talk about rocks all the time. You know that. You know why? Because there are rocks everywhere. I mean, everywhere okay and so when they start talking about analogies you know they start looking around for an analogy kind of like what's God like what is God like Yahweh you know so many times Yahweh God is likened to rocks (laughs) in fact I've listed a number of things that are included for not only our small groups to be able to talk about but perhaps for you in a devotional sense you know uh, second samuel by the way second samuel 222 says the lord is my rock my fortress my deliverer my god my rock in whom i take refuge why is that significant you know why because if you're under assault and you're vulnerable and you're open the place that you run to hide is behind rock <laughs> you run to a cave like David did. David spent a lot of his life, by the way, the Psalms are written about a guy on the run hiding from Saul in caves behind rocks, taking refuge. So when the Jews think about hiding refuge, all of these things, God is our refuge, okay? Rock, Yahweh, the rock of Israel is Yahweh, God himself. And here's the list, he, and, and it's included in your notes. He is their firm foundation, the one they stand on, perfect and just. He's the deliverer. He's the fortress. He's the refuge. He's the stronghold. He's the foundation for every generation. These are things at times in our lives that are helpful for us to meditate on, particularly when we feel at risk, that God can be all of this for us. And maybe for you today, this is a list that you need to take later and meditate on that this is who Yahweh God is he is our fortress he is our refuge he is our rock okay Jesus when he was speaking about a wise person and a foolish person used an analogy and he said you know the wise man is the person who hears my words and he acts upon them the foolish man hears my words and doesn't do anything The foolish man builds his house upon the sand. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. The thing about the houses, they both experience the exact same storm. The only difference between the houses, ultimately, one stood, one did not. Why? Because they took seriously God's word and they acted upon them. Friends, for us to have that foundation of the word of God 
and to learn to live it out in our lives. That's the action that God is calling us to, to listen to his word, to love his word, and to do, obediently do what God says to do. And, and, and when we think about how God sees you, you know how God sees you from this passage? He sees you as a living stone. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, you also, verse 5, you also are living stones, just like Jesus is a living stone. Jesus came from the death to life, so it is that we come from death to life. Here's what you need to know. You may look like a, just a regular old rock, but here's what God thinks about you. You are a precious stone. You are precious to God. And you need to be reminded of that. Besides that, God chose you. God chose you. God loves you. And, and, and we need to be reminded of that. And you know, when, when Jesus, and, and I love this, when Jesus, the very stone that was rejected by man, all of us, our greatest fear so many times is the rejection of man. What people think about us how people reject us and we can take solace in the fact that that Jesus was rejected by man and so that when we experience rejection it's not a foreign concept God knows all about it we can relate to Christ in that way and still know this that even though we are rejected by man we are chosen by God we are precious to God he is our rock he's our fortress he's our foundation People will let you down. They just do, but God won't. And God has, a, God has a purpose. God says, you're a living stone, and here's what I'm doing for you. I am putting you into a, secondly, a spiritual house. In other words, you're not simply living in isolation. Satan loves to isolate people. So if you're going to accept Jesus as your Savior, plan B for, for your life from Satan himself is this. Isolate him. Isolate them so that they're dwelling all alone. But here's what God says. No, I'm calling you into a spiritual house. And, and, and this house that God's building is durable. Now, it, for all of history, almost all of history, there were basically just three products by which you could build a home, all right? Um, and it's pretty much that way in the third world today as well, okay? You got three options. Number one is wood, all right? Um, we were told that there was a lot of wood in Israel back in the day. There certainly isn't now. It's all been you know, harvested and, and all of that, or a lot of it has. So there's not a lot of wood left there. But what, what did they have in abundance, the second thing? We already talked about it. And lots of rocks, all right? So, you I mean, you go to places, for example, if you go to Europe, you go to England and all that, man, it's amazing how many stone walls there. Well, why are they all there? Because there's so many stinking rocks in the field. They had to get them out of the field so they could grow something. And they just made them into walls to kind of divide their property. They made houses out of them. Them, okay they made castles out of them they used rocks everywhere Israel same thing people would build homes with these rocks that was the second material the third material if you don't have wood and you don't have rocks what's your third option mud and basically mud is not very durable in fact you know you get a good good windstorm uh, not a windstorm but a rainstorm and all that it can it can destroy it and so they learned how to do things called kilns you know and they were able to actually bake the bricks so that they'd be a little bit more durable and so those basically even to this day in the third world are your three options now if you had a choice in terms of durability what would you choose answer rocks all right unless you live in california with earthquakes but anyway it, it destroys the analogy but it, but Here's the thing is that, that, that durability, you are being built into a durable house by God, okay? Collectively together with a purpose. So, so what is your purpose? Here it is. Get this. God's calling you into a priesthood. Really? Yeah. Every one of us. God's calling us into a royal priesthood. Okay, let's just for a minute think Catholic priest because we, it's hard for us to relate to the priesthood of Israel because we don't know it that well, all right? But most of us are pretty familiar kind of with the Catholic priest, okay? So let's think about them for a minute. So what's their job ultimately, okay? If you just kind of say, okay, so what's the priest's job? Basically, it's twofold. It's to serve God and to serve the sacraments to people, basically, right? And so it's those two things, to serve God and basically to serve people, all right? And so in, in, this, in this job description that God has for us as priests, let's just kind of boil it down to the same thing that Jesus said early on that we talked about, love God, love people, okay? And the same thing that the royal priesthood calls us into, and that is to serve God, serve people. Now, here's the thing. 
with your best sincere desire, serving people is hard. What happens when you, from the heart, choose to say, oh, you know what? God has saved me. He's delivered me. I know I need to help people, so I'm going to help people. And kind of out of a benevolence of your heart and appreciation, you get engaged, you get involved, you start helping people. And then what happens? They hurt you. They don't appreciate it. You know, you volunteer for something. Almost everybody in the church has a story, all right? They have a story about somehow, somewhere, along the way, they got hurt and, and all of that. And for some people, as a result of that, they become completely disillusioned as a result of being hurt by serving people. There's a real key here to this Priesthood, And that is, if you engage in the priesthood purely to serve people, it's only a matter of time before you will be disillusioned and sidelined. And that's why you have to completely stay. Last week I talked about being fixated, you know, kind of picking a point when you're sailing at the distance that you fixate on so that when you're kind of going into that, that headwind and all, you've got something to look at. Unless you stay fixated on God himself, and you say, God, I am serving you by serving these people. And just as Jesus was misunderstood and rejected at times, there are times that I am going to be misunderstood and rejected as well. But here's the deal. I'm not giving up. I am still serving you. You have to stay focused on him in this priesthood. But there's some really cool benefits that happen when you do serve as a priest. You know what they are? Number one is fulfillment. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. Even though you run the risk of disillusionment in a sense because people at times will hurt you, the truth of the matter is, is that when you serve God and you serve people, your life will be fulfilling. So many people move to the central coast to escape they've had places that they've lived before jobs traffic all this stuff and man when they come to the central coast it's just this like utopian vision of oh man i'm just going to get away from it all and you know and get a little bit of space and not be so close to people and there's this tendency to want to kind of pull back and for a period of time, a lot of people, particularly when they retire, they'll pursue their hobbies and their interests, and you know, they'll, they'll invest a lot of money in those kinds of things and all of that. But here's what you will find eventually, that no matter what it is that you invest in, okay, your time, your energy, and all that stuff, eventually you realize it's not really fulfilling. Fulfillment only comes, true fulfillment only comes when you invest in other people. And for some, they said, no, I've been hurt by other people, so I'm not going to invest. You know what? Here's the thing. Satan won. Satan's won. He got, he got you exactly where he wanted you, to pull back, to not engage with people because you've been hurt, and to not be effective because ultimately fulfillment in your life is only going to come from two places, loving God and loving people. And by the way, the only thing that's going to endure, okay, it's not your hobby. <laughs> it's not your house it's relationships your relationship with God and others and when it comes right down to it to understand that fulfillment comes as a priest for us we're all priests investing in the lives of others even though at times it can be painful guys there's nothing more fulfilling and here's the beautiful message that we have you know and that is that we can free people from doom people are doomed without God you know, we have this opportunity to deliver people out of darkness, which brings us to our next point as well, and that is that God calls us to be living lights. What does it mean to be a living light? It means that we call people out of darkness so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are called to proclaim that. God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light so that you may proclaim the excellencies of God. We get to talk about God. We get to tell our experience, our story with God to other people, what God has done in our lives. 
Secondly, we get to share the mercy of God. Why? Because people are doomed. They are appointed. There's an appointment. They have an appointment for doom. But we have the opportunity to share mercy, you know, um, this mercy of God so that they do not have to face judgment. Let me read in closing Romans for you, okay? Just listen to this. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do, you not, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of the Lord leads you to repentance? Are, are you thinking lightly of these things? Have you forgotten these things? His kindness, his tolerance, his patience? Because of your stubbornness and unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, the revelation, the righteousness of God, who will render to each man according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek glory and honor and immortality and eternal life, but to those whose selfish ambitions do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath indignation there will be tribulation distress for every soul of a man who does evil to the jew first and to the greek but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the jew first to the greek for there is no partiality with god don't forget the mercy the patience the kindness of god people have an appointment with the judgment seat of God. They'll stand before God. We have the privilege as priests in a spiritual house collectively to share the mercy of God that we have experienced with this world that so desperately needs it. And here's what I want to remind you of. Time is short. It's, it's like a flower. It's here today and gone tomorrow. We have to be ready for the opportunities that God brings to us to love people to be called together collectively as a group of people spiritual house and as a group of priests who are ready to dispense the mercies of God to a lost world friends you want fulfillment that's where it's going to come from let's pray father uh, first we, we want to be reminded again that you chose us, that you love us, and that you've called us into a spiritual house, to a royal priesthood, and that we are called as lights to a world that's, that's dwelling in darkness. God, uh, I think there are some here today that have been hurt and, and feel disillusioned, and, and they've pulled back. God, I pray that in their heart today they would see the foolishness of that. God, that they would understand that you know what rejection is like. You've experienced it. And yet, Lord, you call us to love others and to love you from the heart because time is short. And we have such a responsibility to be able to share the love of Christ. May we be serious about that. Open hearts today that have closed. Reignite a fire. Allow us to stay focused and fixated on you so that we can do what you've called us to do. Fervently love one another from the heart. In Jesus' name, amen.